Hello everyone, it's Dr. Locklear here, and we're going to change gears a little bit with this recording and talk about the concept of elimination. And one of the exemplars that falls under elimination is benign prostatic hyperplasia, or BPH. This is exemplar 5.A, so let's get started. Of course, we're going to look at the pathophysiology. How does this occur? What causes it? What are the risk factors? How can it be prevented? What are the clinical manifestations that we see with a person with BPH? How is it diagnosed? And what collaborative therapies are developed to provide care for a patient with this condition? And how do we differentiate care across the lifespan? You usually see this in older adult males. And how do we use the nursing process to uh, care for a patient with BPH? So what is our overview? Prostatitis refers to inflammatory disorders of the prostate gland. Prostodonia is a condition in which the patient experiences the symptoms of prostatitis, but shows no evidence of inflammation or infection. Benign prostatic hyperplasia, or BPH, is a non-malignant enlargement of the prostate gland commonly seen in the aging male. BPH can be a cause of anxiety in patients who fear loss of virility and ability to maintain a satisfying sexual life. Because with BPH, uh, their, their ability to um, be able to have sex is, is affected. And we're going to talk later in this recording about erectile dysfunction. Patient education and support play an important role in providing nursing care to patients with BPH. BPH is the most common benign neoplasm in men. It is characterized by a non-malignant enlargement of the prostate gland that decreases the outflow of urine by obstructing the, the urethra ultimately resulting in difficult urination. Although BPH typically begins in the fourth decade, the patient may not experience symptoms until much later. Depending on how the individual's condition progresses, BPH is not a, a precursor to prostate cancer. What is our patho? The prostate gland borders the urethra near the lower part of the bladder, so it's below the bladder. About the size of a chestnut, two centimeters, it is partially palpable through the anterior wall of the rectum. So when they do a rectal exam on the male, they're checking to see for an enlarged prostate. The prostate is composed of glandular structures that continually leach secrete a milky alkaline solution. During sexual intercourse, Glandular activity increases and the alkaline sec secretions flow into the urethra. Because sperm motility is reduced to an acidic environment, these secretions aid sperm transport. In addition, the prostate gland produces about one-third of all the semen that of a male has. BPH begins as small nodules in the periurethral glands, which are the inner layers of the prostate. The nodules are formed from hyperplasia, which is an increase in the number of cells of the stromal and epithelial cells in the prostate gland. Hyperplasia of the prostate cells occurs over a long period of time, making BPH more common in older men. The pathophysiologic effects result from a combination of factors, such as urethral resistance to the effects of BPH, intravesical pressure during voiding, detrusor muscle strength, neurological functioning, and general health, uh, physical health. So what's the cause? An androgen is a type of hormone that stimulates the development and maintenance of male sex characteristics. The androgen testosterone signals the prostate to produce dihydrotestosterone, or DHT, which mediates prostatic growth. Although androgen levels decrease in the aging prostate, appears to become more sensitive to available DHT. Estrogen, produced in small amounts in men, appears to sensitize the prostate gland to the effects of the DTH. So it's like a balancing act there. 
Increasing estrogen levels associated with aging or a relative increase in estrogen related to testosterone levels contribute to prostatic hyperplasia. Inflammation may also play a role in the development of BPH and appears to be related to the LUTS and prostate size. It has been suggested that inflammatory cytokines associated with obesity may promote LUTS and BPH. Other inflammatory conditions that may be associated with BPH include autoimmune diseases and chronic infections. Your text refers to LUTS, which is lower urinary tract uh, symptoms. So when you're seeing the LUTS, that's what it's talking about. So uh, it didn't say that in the text, but I did want to uh, make you aware of uh, what that means. And uh, again, that is um, looking at the lower urinary tract symptoms or LUTs, okay? The prevalence of BPH is similar in black and white men, but it tends to be more severe and progressive in black men. Studies suggest that there may be a genetic component to BPH in some men. Modifiable risk factors that may lead to BPH include obesity, metabolic syndrome such as diabetes, increased caffeine and coffee intake, and low levels of physical activity. So diet can play a role in this as well. So what is prevention? There is new evidence suggesting the connection between metabolic syndrome and BPH, so it may be more prevalent in men who have diabetes. Um, it may be possible to reduce the risk of BPH by maintaining a healthy lifestyle, controlling body weight, exercising, and controlling blood glucose levels, which we know our blood glucose levels go up. Uh, the more weight that we have on it, it can affect our glucose levels. So if you're an overweight male, um, yes, your weight may make you more susceptible to uh, increased blood glucose, which again, according to this research, can add to the BPH. Multiple studies have attempted to prove the efficacy of using dietary supplements containing antioxidant and anti-inflammatory properties to treat BPH, but none has produced early, meaningful, or consistent results. So a lot of research still needed on this. Clinical manifestations. Although the symptoms of BPH are sometimes referred to as bothersome, they can have a profound effect on daily living. The expanding prostatic tissue compresses the urethra, and there's a picture of that on, up, up above here on page 326, and causes partial or complete obstruction of the outflow of urine from the urinary bladder. Even though the detrusor muscle, the muscle in the wall of the bladder that contracts during urination to release urine, detrusor muscle, becomes hypertrophic during urination, um, I'm sorry, becomes hypertrophic to compensate for increased resistance to urinate flow, decreased bladder capability and bladder instability eventually result. LUTs manifest as two types. Voiding, such as weak urinary system, increased time to void, hesitancy, incomplete bladder emptying, and post-void dribble. And you might see this on the front of some men's clothes where they've got a little wet spot because of the dribble. Uh, storage, such as frequency, urgency, incontinence, nocturia, dysuria, and bladder pain. These symptoms are often used to classify BPH as voiding BPH or storage BPH. Urinary retention may become chronic, resulting in overflow incontinence with an increase in intra-abdominal intra pressure. Patients often report the sensation of incomplete bladder emptying, which is not good because you can have stasis and get a UTI. There is little correlation between the size of the prostate gland and the urinary manifestations. Patient symptoms can be qualified, quantified using the International Prostate Symptom Score, or the IPSS. The IPSS uses a score of zero, not at all, to five, almost always, to collect data about seven subjective factors. Feeling as though the bladder did not empty with toileting, 
needing to urinate within two hours after urinating, starting and stopping the stream several times while urinating, having difficulty delaying urination, having a weak stream, urinating frequently at night, and straining to urinate. In addition to questions about symptoms, these questionnaires also ask how the patient feels about the quality of life due to uh, urinary symptoms. So uh, this can cause a lot of issues in the, the male patient. Unless the enlarging prostate is reduced, multiple complications may occur. As urine is retained, the bladder becomes increasingly distended. Diverticula, which are sac-like outward projections of mucosa protruding through the muscular layer of the bladder wall, develop from the pressure of urinary retention. The distension may also obstruct the ureters. Infection, which is more common in retained urine and in diverticular, may ascend from the bladder to the kidneys. Uh, possible complications include hydrouretor, which is distension of the ureter with urine, or hydronephrosis, which is an accumulation of urine in the renal pelvis as a result of obstructive flow. And then, of course, which leads to um, uh, renal insufficiency. And it's not good. Um, again, it can cause um, uh, infection in the bladder and the kidneys, and it can damage your kidneys and um, lead to all kinds of other problems because we know if our kidneys aren't filtered, we've got other issues. On the bottom of page 326, you have clinical manifestations. You have a little chart there. Uh, voiding BPH, storage BPH, and urinary retention. So voiding is weak or intermittent urinary stream, hesitancy, incomplete emptying, dribbling at the end of urination, straining during urination. Therapies, pharmacologic, and lifestyle changes. Storage BPH is frequency, urgency, incontinence, nocturia, dysuria, and bladder pain. Again, pharmacologic and lifestyle changes. Urinary retention, you have bladder distension, diverticular, ureter obstruction, bladder or kidney infection, hydroureter, hydronephrosis, and renal insufficiency. And it may not be able to be treated with medicines. You may have to uh, have surgery. So what is our, um, our uh, collaboration? Care of patients with BPH focuses on diagnosing the disorder, correcting or minimizing the urinary obstruction, and preventing or treating complications. Treatment is determined by the severity of the manifestations and the presence of complications. In mild cases, lifestyle modifications are recommended and symptoms are monitored over time and may remain stable. Moderate to severe symptoms require medical or surgical treatment to control and improve symptoms. Education is the key. So we need to educate, and as soon as they start having symptoms, they need to go in and get checked. Look on the top of page 327, and this is a digital rectal exam to palpate the prostate gland. And so the, the physician goes in with the glove finger in the rectum and can feel if that prostate gland's enlarged or not. Diagnostic test, the most common is the digital rectal exam. The healthcare provider inserts a glove and lubricated finger into the rectum to palpate the prostate gland and determine its size and condition. And they'll have the, the patient to cough, so it'll kind of move it up a little bit so they can feel it. Several urine tests may be performed, including a urine flow rate test, a post-void residual urine test, amount of urine remaining in the bladder after voiding, and a pressure flow study. A urinalysis and urine culture may be done to check for blood or infection. Serum prostate-specific antigen, or PSA, levels are often elevated with BPH and may also be performed to rule out prostate cancer. You do see PSA elevated with prostate uh, cancer. Uh, Non-pharmacological therapy, patients with mild symptoms of BPH, an IPSS score less than 7, are often treated with watchful waiting and lifestyle changes. Using the IPSS score as a guide, many of these individuals experience relief of symptoms without treatment, but all patients with mild BPH should be regularly monitored for worsening of symptoms. Lifestyle changes are appropriate for men with mild BPH. And see box 1.5 on the top of page 327. 
and it talks about avoiding alcohol, spicy foods, caffeine, drink small amounts of fluid spread out through the day, avoid drinking fluids close to bedtime, avoid over-the-counter cold and sinus medications that contain decongestants or antihistamines, develop a schedule for voiding and bladder training, exercise regularly, including pelvic floor exercises to strengthen the muscle, develop bowel habits to avoid constipation, and reduce stress. Pharmacologic therapy, patients experiencing moderate, moderate IPSS score of 8 to 18 or severe IPSS score greater than 19, symptoms of BPH are prescribed medications to reduce symptoms, slow the progression of the disorder, and reduce the need for surgery. And the medications are 5.3, and that's on page 328. Men with moderate to severe LUTs due to excessive smooth muscle contraction may be treated with alpha adrenergic blockers, which relax the smooth muscle of the prostate and the bladder. Men whose symptoms are due to androgen-dependent prostate growth may be treated with 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, which have anti-androgen properties that decrease prostate size and, ri and the risk of urinary retention. Research suggests that a combination of an alpha adrenergic blocker and a 5 ARI may reduce progression of BPH more than either class of medication alone. Pregnant women should not handle capsules or crushed tablets of 5-alpha reductase inhibitors because the drug may be absorbed through the skin and can harm a male fetus. Anticholinergic agents, also called anti-muscarinic drugs, which relax the detrusor muscle of the bladder, can be used to treat urinary urgency, frequency, and urge incontinence. While there has been concern that anticholinergic drugs increase the risk of urinary retention in men with BPH, they can be given to those with a post void residual less than 200 milliliters. Anticholinergics may be combi combined with alpha adrenergic blockers to produce a greater reduction in LUTs and post void residuals than an alpha adrenergic drug alone. Beta-3 agonists reduce LUTs such as frequency, urgency, and urgency incontinence. Phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors, or PDE5, reduce LUTs and improve erectile dysfunction. They may be added to an alpha blocker to reduce LUTs greater than each drug used alone. Certain commonly used over-the-counter medications may worsen symptoms of BPH. Alpha adrenergic agents found in decongestants such as pseudoephedrine and phenylphrine phenyl, phenyl <laughs> may activate alpha adrenergic receptors in the bladder neck, causing restriction of urine flow. Drugs with anticholinergic effects, which they're drying, anticholinergic means they dry you up. Side effects such as antihistamines, tricyclic antidepressants, and phenothiazines could also adversely affect BPH. Testosterone and other anabolic steroids may increase prostate enlargement, subsequent, subsequently increasing the physical obstruction of the urethra. And your drugs are listed on page 328, and you've got your um, alpha adrenergic blockers. Uh, teach the patient to change position slowly because these are uh, beta blockers and they can cause orthostatic hypertension. That first dose effect, the drop in blood pressure, uh, fatigue, um, you need to check with the healthcare provider before taking any medicines for coughs, colds, or allergies and teach the patient to alert the ophthalmologist about use of the blockers if they're considering cataract surgery as floppy iris syndrome is a risk. Then you got your 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. Teach the patient about side effects such as erectile dysfunction, re reduced libido, which is sex drive, and uh, reduced ejaculation dysfunction. You got your anticholinergics, oxybutynin and detrol, and uh, administer tablets whole, do not crush, 
monitor for urinary retention, avoid use in patients with uncontrolled narrow angle glaucoma because of the drying effect, and that affects your eyes as well. If you've ever taken allergy medicine, you know how to dry your eyes out. Uh, beta-3 agonist, this is my Bertrig, and avoid use in patients with poorly controlled hypertension. And then the uh, phosphodiacetase, the uh, PED-5, this is your tadilophil, which is Cialis. This reduces smooth muscle tone of prostate through inhibition of the uh, uh, PGE5. Avoid use in men who take nitrates or have reduced kidney function. So a lot of, of alerts there with these medications. And um, so you need to review those. And uh, here's just a, a little picture uh, that gives you some idea about um, how urgency can be improved with certain uh, interventions. Pharmacological therapy, uh, again, those uh, uh, phosphodiesterase inhibitors, um, and I just went over those, okay? And then I talked about the over-counter, um, your pseudoephedrine, phenylphene, and uh, so make sure you look at all of those, okay? All right, surgery. So what kind of surgery? Uh, men who have urinary retention, recurrent UTIs, hematuria, bladder stones, or renal insufficiency, secondary to BPH, or those with LUTs who do not respond to lifestyle or pharmacological therapy are candidates for surgical interventions. Transurethral procedures to treat BPH may use surgical or minimally invasive techniques. Open surgical procedures may also be performed. Uh, minimally invasive surgery, a number of procedures that are less invasive than traditional surgeries have been developed to relieve the manifestations of BPH while reducing the risk of incontinence and erectile dysfunction associated with the transurethral resection of the prostate, which is a TERP. Transurethral microwave thermotherapy uses microwaves to heat and destroy excess prostate tissue. During the procedure, I've never seen this done. I have seen a TURP, but not, this, not the TUMT. Uh, during the procedure, a cooling system protects the urinary tract. Although the TUMT procedures do not cure BPH, they reduce urinary manifestations, but have a high rate of symptom recurrence. These procedures do not cause impotence or incontinence. In the transurethral incision of the prostate, small incisions are made in the smooth muscle where the prostate is attached to the bladder neck. The gland is split to reduce pressure of the urethra. No tissue is removed, so this procedure is most appropriate for men with smaller prostate glands. The TUIP has the advantage of lower risk of postoperative retrograde ejaculation that is associated with the TURP and other prost prostatectomy procedures. Prostatic urethral lift involves placement of implants that retract the obstructing prostatic lobes. The PUL offers improvement in both voiding and storage LUTs, but not as effectively as the TURP. It has the advantage, however, of preserving sexual function. And you know, that's very important to men. They don't wanna lose you know, their ability you know, to perform with their partner. Other types of minimally, minimally invasive techniques used to BPH include transurethral vaporation of the prostate, photoselective va vaporization of the prostate, laser enucleation, aquablation, and water vapor thermal therapy. Then the next one is the TERP. And this is, you see this done a, a lot. And here's a picture of the TERP. They actually, they reset the, um, the prostate gland away from around the um, urethra. So transurethral resection of the prostate or a TERP is the surgical procedure most often performed. A resectoscope is inserted through the urethra and the obstructing prostate tissue is excised or cut and removed with electrocautery wire loop. And that cautery can burn it off to keep it from bleeding while it's uh, cutting it away. 
During the procedure, the surgeon uses the resectoscope to remove obstructing tissue in several segments. The segments of tissue are then flushed into the bladder with irrigation solution, where they are stored until the end of the surgery and then flushed out of the body. Potential postoperative complications include hemorrhage, clot retention, inability to void, UTI. TERP syndrome, a rare but critical complication, results in hypervolemia and severe hyponatremia. Possible long-term complications include incontinence, impotence, and retrograde ejaculation. Open surgery, when the prostate gland is very large, an open prostatectomy may be uh, required, so even more invasive surgery for that. So the nursing process. The nurse caring for a patient with BPH must be sensitive to his concerns and feels fears while providing education and support. Of course, I mean, this is a very sensitive area for a male patient. And on the top of page 329, it gives you some communication uh, techniques uh, with your patient. Make sure you read over those. So what is our assessment? Men over the age of 40 should be assessed for possible BPH. Uh, depending on their health history, should be screened for prostate cancer. Assessment includes a health history, physical assessment, and diagnostic test. The health history includes risk factors, urinary elimination patterns, and manifestations, hematuria, and pain. Symptoms of BPH can be assessed with the IPSS tool and all those seven questions to determine the degree of bothersome of symptoms and their effect on quality of life. Since BPH and its treatments can cause sexual dysfunction, a sexual history should be included. And this is a, a very private area. The person may not be as willing to open up to you uh, uh, when you ask some of those sexual questions, but you need to explain to them that it's, you know, you need to gather some data, um, you know, so they can help better uh, uh, determine what type of procedure or medications you may need. So you gotta keep it on a professional level. The, the physical examination usually includes a DRE of the external surface of the prostate for size, symmetry, firmness, and nodules. In BPH, the prostate is asymmetrical and enlarged. Abnormal findings include tenderness, masses, nodules, hardness, or overly soft. Nodules may be characteristic of prostate cancer, while tenderness usually indicates prostatitis. Palpation of the abdomen may reveal urinary retention because you may have a full bladder. Diagnoses, here are your diagnoses, lack of knowledge, sexual dysfunction, uh, risk for pain, acute pain, uh, a potential for thromboembolism because it's surgery. Goals, verbalize name of each medication, verbalize realistic goals about sexual dysfunction, verbalize realistic outcomes, do they know what's gonna happen to them after surgery? Demonstrate fluid volume balance, talk about um, UTI, what to look for, and how to look for the, the bleeding. Pain is at a comfortable level, absence of thromboemboli, improved IPSS score, and care required at home after surgery. So you got to do a, a lot of teaching. Um, so what do we look at when, um, when we're starting to implement uh, measures? And on page um, 329, uh, it gives you at the very top of the page uh, a few more bullets um, than what was on the, the slide. Um, it says the patient will demonstrate minimal evidence of bleeding, such as a stable hemoglobin and hematocrit, and a lack of large clot passing, because you don't want them to pass clots. You don't want them to have a UTI. You don't want them to uh, have uh, elevated white blood count. You want their vital signs and their electrolytes to be within the normal range, and you want them to remain alert and oriented. Implementation. Care of the patient with BPH differs based on treatment decisions and indications for surgical intervention. All patients need to be educated about their treatment and have their sexual concerns addressed. For those having surgery, fluid levels, urinary elimination, bleeding pain, and risk for deep vein thrombosis all need to be monitored. So what do we uh, do when we provide education? Of course, you wanna to talk to them about those lifestyle changes in box 5.1. So let's go back and 
again, look at those. There's seven or eight bullets there, and I went over those already. Um, if the patient does not need surgical intervention, nursing care includes primarily patient teaching about to topics such as self-care, proper administration of medication, medication side effects, because some of, remember some of them are beta blockers, so they can affect your blood pressure, and symptoms to report to the physician. Uh, when you're educating, um, you want to talk about the non-pharmacological approach, approaches for patients with symptoms, especially those who are taking the watchful waiting approach. So they're just waiting to see what happens. Nursing care of all patients involves answering the patient's questions and providing emotional support. Patients who need surgical intervention will require more in-depth nursing care. Discuss sexual concerns. Discuss the potential for pharmacotherapy for BPH to cause sexual dysfunction. The patient may elect to continue with these medicines or discontinue and do the watchful eye. Patients who undergo a TERP may experience temporary sexual dysfunction. Uh, some patients may find it helpful to speak with a counselor. So this, some of these procedures can and hinder that. Prepare for surgery. Sensitive and thorough preoperative care, education, and support are critical to the patient's subjective view of the surgery. Remember, uh, we educate and teach before the surgical procedure. Patients may be confused about the surgical approach because there are several different methods. Patient teaching reduces anxiety related to fear of the unknown and increases patient participation. Men may be anxious about the outcome and its potential uh, long-term effects on their sexuality. They should communicate a willingness, the nurse should communicate a willingness to address any concerns or anxiety by maintaining a professional approach. Because like I said, talking about sexual things sometimes can be an uncomfortable conversation. Explain to the patient that uh, he may have urinary catheter and possible bladder irrigation when upon returning from surgery. The nurse should also explain that the patient will be treated prophylactically for venous thromboembolism, uh, wearing the pneumatic compression devices, and they may even have Lovenox, and a bowel preparation such as an enema just to clean out the bowel and relieve any pressure. And right here, this is a three-way Foley catheter that they use when they do continuous bladder irrigation. And I got a picture of that too. So after they do a TERP, they put the three-way catheter in through the penis up into the bladder, and then they hang these big 3,000 liter bags and it's connected to one of the ports and it's constantly irrigating, irrigating, irrigating. You just, you just run it wide open and uh, you're, you're flushing out those clots. That's what you're trying to do. Um, here I have a video. We'll watch this in class. You can watch this as well on continuous bladder irrigation. It's a very good video. Um, implementation of fluid balance, acridine O. Uh, amount of irrigating solution in the three-way. Assess patency of the drains and the urinary catheters because of the blood clots and look for signs of infection. Keep them uh, clear, uh, don't have any kinks in them. Uh, we want to reduce the risk of hemorrhage. Assess for TERP syndrome, a serious complication in which too much hypotonic irrigation fluid is absorbed systemically during and after surgery causing the patient to become severely hyponatremic and hypervolemic. This syndrome manifested by confusion, nausea and vomiting, hypertension, bradycardia, and visual disturbances requires management in the ICU. Notify the surgical team immediately since this syndrome can result in dysrhythmias, seizures, and hemodynamic compromise. Care includes infusing a hypertonic solution cardiac monitoring, sedation, and administering a diuretic because if you're hyponatremic, you want to turn it around with hypertonic. Monitor for bleeding, including bright red bloody urine, presence of large clots, decreased urinary output, bladder spasm, a decreased hemoglobin and hematocrit, tachycardia, hypotension. Postoperative hemorrhage may be arterial or venous and may be pre precipitated by movement, Bladder spans are obstruction. Instruct the patient with the three-way uh, to keep the legs straight while the traction is in place. A three-way catheter or balloon is usually inserted. The inflated balloon is pulled down to the prosthetic fossa, and the catheter tubing is pulled down and taped to the patient's leg. 
And so then they have this continuous bladder irrigation. And like I showed you, it's that 3,000 liters and it's, it's constantly flushing that. If they, if they don't, that he's going to have so many blood clots, he's not going to be, it's going to get blocked up. It's going to be a, a major problem. Okay. Um, if the CBI is not used, irrigate the indwelling catheter as prescribed, usually when the urine is frankly bloody or has numerous larger clots. Use sterile technique. The catheter is gently irrigated with sterile irrigating solution. And you would only do this um, under the supervision of the, the doctor's orders. You wouldn't just go in. If they don't have the continuous bladder irrigation, it's saying here that you may have to flush the Foley yourself and you need a doctor's order to do that. Uh, maintain urinary uh, elimination. Um, of course, we want to uh, make sure uh, that we explain that they may have bladder spasms. Um, administer medication to alleviate that discomfort. Explain that although the presence of a urinary catheter may cause the sensation of needing to void, it is important not to strain while they have the catheter in because it can cause bladder spasms. Following catheter removal, assess the amount, color, and consistency of urine and explain that the patient may have burning on urination and dribbling, and they may see small clots. To improve urinary control, teach the Kegel exercises, and your book refers you back to Exemplar 5B for Kegel exercises. Reduce the risk of infection. Uh, prophylactic antibiotics. Um, CBI, we need to use sterile technique. Keep the urine drain bag lower than the bladder. You should already know that from fundamentals. Monitor the vital signs for indications of infection, such as fever and tachycardia, and the blood work. Okay, And assess your analysis and CBC for indications of infection. And so now I've caught up to my slides. Um, relieve acute pain. Of course, using the pain scale, administer pain medicines and antispasmodic bladder medications reassess the pain level and explain the importance of controlling pain uh, so the patient is able to ambulate and reduce the risk of post-operative thrombi. Prevent venous stasis, uh, again your sequential compression devices, anti-embolic therapy, uh, early ambulation, uh, look for swelling, redness of the calf or thigh, chest pain, shortness of breath, tachycardia, uh, administer antithrombotic prophylactic medications such as your Lovenox, and leg exercises and ambulation. And then prepare for discharge. You want to teach the patient and the family how to care for an indwelling catheter, discharge instructions, and um, uh, so they know how to take care of it when they get home. Because once they get home, they may not be able to, um, the catheter may be out or it may not be out. And so they need to know what to do once they get home. The next part of the recording is about erectile dysfunction. And this is a very short section. So um, I'm really not going to uh, read it. I want you to read it on your own. And I'm going to tell you what you need to read. This starts on page 1558. And erectile dysfunction is the most common male sexual problem. Uh, because, uh, you know, when you have an erectile disorder, it affects your ability to uh, uh, be sexually active. And so that can be very um, emotionally uh, uh, for the uh, male patient. Uh, you need to read, starting on page 1558 and then 1559, read all of that. And then there's table 19.6. And it talks about the common causes of erectile dysfunction. And you've got uh, several things, vascular, neurologic, urinary, endocrine, respiratory. It, it, it could be a lot of things. And it could be uh, related to certain diseases, diabetes, heart disease, kidney disease, um, Peroni's disease is when there's the, the penis is not straight. Alcohol use, drug use. Um, and medicines, a, a lot of medications, antihistamines, antidepressants, tranquilizers, and so forth. Please look at that chart. And then prevention, uh, this goes on uh, to page 1560. 
So it starts on page 1558, 1559, and 1560. Okay, and then I want you to go to page 1564, and it's drugs used to treat male sexual dysfunction. And, you know, some of the most common are your Viagra and your Cialis. And so um, you want to monitor for signs and symptoms of cardiac distress, chest pain. Uh, some of these medications cause, they cause dilation, so they can get more blood into the penis to, to get the erection, and it can drop the, the blood pressure. Do not take with cardiac medications such as nitroglycerin. Do not take more than once a day. Actions may be delayed with high-fat meal. Um, you know, so these can have some severe uh, cardiac side effects, especially if you're already taking medication. So make sure you, you read that section on erectile dysfunction.